How will we power our future? Can we create a healthy and clean economy? Climate One at the Commonwealth Club is at the forefront of the global debate about energy, economy, and the environment. Bringing together the brightest and most provocative leaders of our time, Climate One is the place where big ideas get heard. With thoughtful and insightful discussions on policy, business, science, and culture, Climate One founder Greg Dalton gets to the heart of the matter. It's our future. It's time to come together. Today on the show, PG&E recently announced it aims to close the Diablo Canyon nuclear power plant. Energy experts are here for a lively debate on whether or not this is sound energy policy. If you care about climate change, this proposal is ridiculous. It's disastrous. And can California get to 100% clean power? We look at perceived technological barriers to a renewable energy future. The idea is to electrify everything. If you electrify everything, the first thing that happens is you reduce power demand. But first, how safe is the U.S. electric grid? And will making it greener make it more or less secure? That decentralized energy picture has a, has a number of benefits. Up next on Climate One. Is the smart grid vulnerable to hackers and terrorist attacks? Does it endanger your personal privacy? What is the role of the government and private companies in protecting and policing this new frontier? We're joined by three experts with deep knowledge of these issues. Retired Army General Keith Alexander was head of the National Security Agency from 2005 to 2014 and chief of the U.S. Cyber Command for four of those years. He retired shortly after Edward Snowden leaked documents revealing the NSA was secretly collecting data from all phone calls Americans made inside the country. Alfred Berkeley served in the U.S. Air Force and was president of the NASDAQ stock market from 1996 to 2000. Dave Mount is partner in the Green Growth Fund at the venture capital firm Kleiner Perkins Caulfield & Byers. Please welcome them to Climate One. <clears throat> We're talking about a decentralized world where rather than a few small power plants, people are making energy, Dave Mount, uh, on their rooftop. Uh, how is that better than fossil fuels and is it more vulnerable to attack? Sure. So that decentralized energy picture has a, has a number of benefits. I think it is more sustainable, so there's lower emissions. It's, um, uh, it's, it's decentralized. It's easier to turn on and off at a small scale. So you, you can turn it on and off in, por in percentages of a home as opposed to in, in 100,000 person increments. So I think that it is, it's, it's safer, it's theoretically more reliable and theoretically more secure. And can I go into why mm -hmm. more secure? Mm -hmm. um, so the, the theory about, about this security is the, the vulnerability of the grid comes at communication nodes and right now, Again, there are 7,000 power plants in the United States. Each one of them has a, the, a, a generating capacity to serve hundreds of thousands of homes, typically. If one of those gets taken out, hundreds of thousands of homes go, go out as well. So the idea is that if you've got millions of solar panels or millions of batteries that are powering people's cars or tens of millions of, um, of small micro generators or hundreds of thousands of wind turbines, if one of them fails, the consequence of that failure is much smaller. Uh, so I think that th there is a resilience in a more decentralized grid that, that has certain definite benefits. General Alexander, what are the benefits moving away from fossil fuels? You've heard Al Gore give a presentation recently about this. There's a security aspect. So what are the dimensions of moving from fossil fuels to cleaner, and what we heard Dave just said, uh, more secure energy? I, I think it's something that we, uh, the people in this room, our generation should leave for the future generations. When you look at, I, I was impressed. I saw a, a presentation from uh, former Vice President Al Gore on uh, climate, and it was amazing to see the damage that's being uh, that's occurring, and what we can do for solar power and renewable energy to turn that around. We've got to do that, and in doing that, when you think about it, where the major power companies like PG&E and others can actually come into play is on creating what Dave was uh, referring to, but I'll take it one step further, a mesh network where solar panels around the country can be used to give us sustainable power with other forms of energy in a way that we've never done before. That's where it's all going to go. Now the question is, do we lead, follow, or get out of the way? 
And you know, I think what uh, Dixon Wright is doing with Orange Button with L and trying to push that solar thing is absolutely the right way to go. We ought to lead, get small businesses in there, help do this. It's, it saves the future for my grandchildren, for our grandchildren, and it's something that we ought to do. General Keith Alexander is former head of the NSA. I'd like to ask Alfred Berkeley, will the incumbent companies, the fossil fuel companies, will they try to block and slow down the, the future the general just described? I think there's always a tendency on the part of incumbents to protect what they have. But I think the insurgent newcomers into the game are playing such a forceful game that they're going to force the issue. And you're going to see the existing incumbents trying to get on the sustainable uh, bandwagon. I want to bring this to the grid. Uh, Ted Koppel, the journalist from Nightline ABC News, wrote a book, a, a Lights Out, said that the grid is vulnerable as it is today. And General Alexander, it could be out for a long time. The government is unprepared. This is, he painted a very dark sort of doomsday scenario. How realistic is that? You bring out an incredibly important <clears throat> point, and that is today, uh, as companies and as individuals, if a nation state were to attack us in cyberspace, should we be expected to be able to, to uh, defeat a nation state attacking us? We don't in the physical area. Why is it in cyber? And then if we say, no, nope, the government's got to step in there, you get to the question, so how do you do that? So the recent cyber legislation was to say, well, government and industry ought to be able to pass information back and forth. Dave Mount, a lot of Silicon Valley companies want the government as far away as possible. And yet what we just heard from the general is that there needs to be closer collaboration and information sharing with government. What does tech companies think about that? So I think you're right. Most, most, technical, uh, most tech companies need to be sure they can succeed without regulation. And that's how they would think about it. If, if, a, if a company requires some piece of regulation in order to be successful, very difficult to succeed or very difficult to get the backing of, of venture capitalists. I think in the case of security, and I think in, in, these, in these discussions that we're having around security for the Internet of Things, security for the grid, there is a, an important distinction to be made around um, the security of personally identifiable information or emails from a, from a Sony type of situation and the actual physical security that can be at risk because of vulnerabilities around the grid. And I think that that, uh, that distinction is clear enough wh where I would say the government probably does have a role in, in organizing or orchestrating to defend against threats that could have a physical security safety impact. Some of those things like if, if a power plant could, could actually get shut down. The cases that, that uh, Ted Koppel uh, describes in his book, um, those seem uh, separate and distinct enough from my perspective to, to warrant having, having a broader Could, discussion. Uh, we're going to go to our lightning round and ask some uh, brisk questions, uh, single answer questions, uh, starting with Dave Mount. Uh, true or false, Alexa, the new speech bot from Amazon, is more useful than Siri. True. Uh, also for Dave Mount, Alexa sent flowers to your wife for you after a recent argument at home. False. So Alexa can listen and watch everything in your home, right? And you don't know exactly yes. what Amazon is listening to. Alexa heard the argument, but I was not, uh, I was not smart enough to ask for her to order flowers <laughs> as well. Um, Alfred Berkeley, the idea of a machine listening and watching everything in your home is a little creepy, yes or no? Yes. Um, Keith Alexander, General Alexander, the possibilities of that excite you. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> it, it actually causes me a sleepless nights just thinking about that. No offense, Alfred. I mean, <laughs> Alfred Berkeley, uh, true or false? Venture capitalists are not as smart as they think they are. False. Uh, Dave Mount, true or false? Venture capitalists have a terrible track record in the energy sector. True. Uh, General Alexander, you enjoy answering questions from guys like me. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> uh, Alfred Berkeley, the United States has run up huge federal deficits on two wars funded off the national balance sheet and underinvested in infrastructure. Yes. True. Uh, Excuse me. Dave Mount, you are glad data stored on your iPhone is encrypted. True. Uh, Alfred Berkeley, the NSA can look at it anyway. 
True. General Alexander, <laughs> your former colleagues peeked at my iPhone in preparation for this program. False. Uh, also for it, we didn't have your name. We didn't know you were sitting on it. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Sure. Uh, uh, also for General Alexander, you enjoy Jason Bourne movies. I do. <laughs> In fact, I look amazingly like him. I, <laughs> I, I try to sell that. I know it's not working. <laughs> they're all the same, but they're still good. He's um, great. Alfred Berkeley, true or false, some cybersecurity companies are hyping the threats of hackers to pump up their business. True. Also for Alfred Berkeley, Stuxnet may come back to haunt the United States. True. Dave Mount, government protection of data held by companies could be considered a form of corporate welfare. True. General Alexander, uh, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, or FISA Court, is a rubber stamp. False. Last one for General Alexander. Uh, first word that comes to your mind when I say, President Donald Trump overseeing the NSA and CIA. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> that ends our lightning round. Let's give them a round. Thanks them for that. <laughs> Up next, the future of Diablo Canyon. Joining our live audience, we're pleased to have four guests with varying views on nuclear power in the age of climate disruption. David Baker is a reporter for the San Francisco Chronicle, where he covers PG&E and other energy companies. John Giesman is former executive director of the California Energy Commission. He's a legal advisor to the Alliance for Nuclear Responsibility, an anti-atomic group that supports PG&E's plan to close Diablo Canyon. Diane Grunick is a former commissioner for the California Public Utilities Commission, who is now with the Precourt Institute for Energy at Stanford. And Michael Schellenberger is president of Environmental Progress, a pro-nuclear advocacy group. Please welcome them to Climate One. Thanks, Greg. David Baker, let's begin with you. Uh, set the context uh, in terms of powering the California economy. How big a deal is this, shutting down Diablo Canyon, which is 20% of PG&E's power? Yeah, it's, it's quite a big deal, um, not just in terms of PG&E, but in the entire state. The state had, up until a couple of years ago, two nuclear power plants running. And then in 2012, one of them closed down because it had a little bit of radioactive steam that leaked out of a particular part. And it turned out that the plant had just spent a whole lot of money on new equipment that was badly designed or just not working properly. And rather than go through the whole process of trying to keep it open and relicensing and all that, its owners decided to close it down. So that left us with just one plant, Diablo Canyon. And to give you a sense of how big the plant is in terms of its importance to the state, last year it was 9%, more than 9% of all the electricity that was generated within California's borders. So all of that coming out of this one plant. Uh, earlier today I spoke with Bill Mannheim, who's legal counsel for energy supply at PG&E. Uh, he talked about why they're closing Diablo Canyon. Let's hear from Bill Mannheim. So the underpinning of PG&E's decision not to relicense Diablo Canyon is really in California's existing green energy policies, which are really visionary. But they are seeking to double energy efficiency by 2030 and increase renewable power to 50% by that time. That displaces the need for much of Diablo Canyon's energy. It's a business decision that was driven by the reality that we no longer need by 2030 the output of Diablo Canyon, and that from a policy perspective and from an economic perspective, it was better to replace the portion that is needed for our customers with energy efficiency and renewables. That's Bill Mannheim from PG&E. Uh, Michael Schellenberger, he said they don't need the power, they're going to replace it. What's your response? California tries to take credit as a climate leader, but in fact, our emissions have declined slower than the national average. If this proposal goes forward, and I don't agree with the way you framed it, you suggested that it is going to close. It is a proposal to close it. Um, emissions will go up the equivalent of adding 1.3 million cars to the road. Um, it will be replaced by natural gas. There's literally nothing in the proposal that requires that Diablo be replaced by any amount of clean power. In fact, on both of the key elements, it just says, we'll do a bunch of energy efficiency. Now, I think the people in California signed, didn't sign up for that. I think we signed up for clean power, for clean energy that doesn't destroy our beautiful desert landscapes. We didn't sign up for big natural gas leakages, but that's exactly what this proposal would lead to. If they succeed with this proposal to close Diablo Canyon, 
we will become 70% dependent on natural gas. That is a fuel that is just notorious for having huge price spikes. So what we're looking at is a big increase in carbon emissions, big increases in electricity prices, and really, um, I have to say, just the corruption of a basic positive vision that California has had as an environmental and climate leader. How about the, the idea that there's no guarantee in the proposal that it will be renewable power, that it could be natural gas? Does the, does the proposal say what Diablo Canyon electricity has to be replaced it with? It most certainly does, and I don't think Mike has closely read it if he actually feels that way. Uh, there are very clear tranches of new supply that the proposal uh, specifies. Now, I will acknowledge those tranches only address about one-third of the Diablo Canyon out output. Diane Grunick, let's get you in here. Uh, you've been on the Public Utilities Commission. One of the interesting things here is that, that the state is predicting declining electricity use. There's, there's a shrinking market here, and it seems to be that there's some scramble of what's going on and how to, how to supply that shrinking market. Is that right? Um, let me just say that I find the situation in heaven forbid, about 40 years involved in energy um, in California, about the most interesting one we've ever tackled or been faced with. And part of what's so interesting is that everywhere else that we've dealt with nuclear, it's been a very sudden closing. That, needless to say, had a lot of people upset. But in this situation, we actually have seven years to plan. And that, to me, is what's so extraordinary. The same thing with um, New York. The economics of the market there, the plant operators no longer were making money. And shareholders do not just donate, let's keep a nuclear power plant in operation. So it's a very different situation. Um, and we are, with all of our policies, what we're striving for is a dramatic change in how we're all going to get electricity. What does this tell us about the future? It does tell us a couple of things about what, where PG&E and also the people who manage the state's electricity grid think things are going to be 10, 15 years down the road. And it's not necessarily that the amount of electricity we'll use overall will shrink, but it's not going to grow very much. Um, I was visiting two weeks ago this organization based in Folsom, uh, California Independent System Operator. They're the people who actually run the grid. And they are projecting that you look out 10 years from now, and it's basically going to be about the same electricity demand in the state that we have right now, but with a much higher percentage of solar, a bit higher percentage of wind, and a lot of fast-ramping natural gas plants can, that can move up and down as the rest of the system needs it. A big plant like... Diablo, which was designed to go up to full power and just stay there day and night, is kind of a tough fit for all of that. Michael Shelver, your response to the, this big nuclear plants don't fit into the future we're going into. I mean, listen, I mean, it's funny, right? Because it's like, I thought we cared about climate change, right? So if you're going to take 9% of our power away, why are you going to take it away from a clean energy source? Why not go from 61 to 51% natural gas? Why remove 20% of full one-fifth of our zero carbon power? The only reason to do it is because you think that there's something really scary or dangerous about nuclear power. But the, the medical journals, the British medical journal Lancet, finds that nuclear is the safest way to generate reliable power. There's been a fear-mongering campaign against this plant, including by John's organization, for almost 40 years. That's what's underlying it. And, you know, with all due respect, David, you make it sound like the market is sort of operating without, you know, just sort of on its own. The market is constructed by policies. So... What pg &E very clearly said is that if you're trying to get, if we have to get to 50% renewables, it's very hard to do that if nuclear is not counted as renewables. They went to the legislature and said, we'd like to be able to count nuclear as renewables, and they were denied. They were lobbied against by all the so-called environmental groups, the anti-nuclear groups, that wanted to keep nuclear out of that definition of renewables. So here we are in a situation where California imports one-third of our power from out of state. You know, we have 61% of our power from natural gas. Why is it that we would be taking offline this amazing source of zero carbon power 24-7 it produces power? So if you care about climate change, this proposal is ridiculous. It's disastrous. Up next, can California get to 100% clean power? We have three guests on the program who are deeply involved in this debate. Mark Farron is a member of the California Independent System Operator. That's the agency that runs the electric grid. He's a former member of the California Public Utility Commission, and a disclosure, he's a donor to Climate One. 
Mark Jacobson is Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Stanford. He's on the board of the Solutions Project, a group advocating for 100% clean energy across America. Steve Malnight is Senior Vice President at PG&E, California's largest electric utility. Please welcome them to Climate One. Mark Jacobson, 100%, it sounds like a big, hairy, audacious goal. Tell us how California could get there. Well, we've been developing plans for all states, all 50 states, in fact, and now 139 countries, and California in particular. And, and these plans are to convert each state to 100% renewable energy, not only for electricity, but also transportation, heating, cooling, industry, agriculture, forestry, and fishing. And the idea is to electrify everything. If you electrify everything, the first thing that happens is you reduce power demand. In California, that's 44% reduction of power demand by electrifying. And then you provide all that electricity with clean, renewable wind, water, and solar, onshore and offshore wind, solar rooftop PV, and power plant PV, photovoltaics that is, concentrated solar power with storage, some geothermal power, uh, existing hydroelectric power, and small amounts of tidal and wave. And we found that you can do this in California, use less than a, uh, half a percent of the state's land area for what we call footprint on the ground. What gives me hope is if we do, if we can get to 100% clean renewable energy, then by 2050, uh, we found through simulations of CO carbon dioxide that by 2100, we can get uh, between 350, 400 parts per million. So there is hope. Mark Fair and the, the utilities always say, oh, it's gonna be hard, it's gonna take longer, but they, they oftentimes get to those goals faster uh, than pe the people anticipated five years ago. So what do you think about 100% by 2050? We have to put it in the context. That is essential if we're gonna to get to what we need to do in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So 50% um, renewable is just barely on the edge of being consistent with a 40% reduction in greenhouse gases by 2030 from the 1990 levels, which is, what, what scientists tell us we need to do to, to, to keep uh, the, the impact of climate change um, uh, at, a, at, a, at, a, at a manageable level. Um, now, going beyond that gets much more difficult. And uh, it's because um, we are very reliant on fossil fuels, in California in particular, natural gas, for um, making up for the intermittency and the variability of renewables. And that is a tricky engineering exercise to, to, uh, to get around. So as if you think about, if you do the math, 50% renewable energy plus hydro, et cetera, you get to somewhere around 25% natural gas, which is very low. And going below that um, really does raise some questions about reliability of the system. Steve Melnight, uh, there's a difference between academic theory and, and practice and industry. So do you think that some of those uh, theories that are, are practical now in the industry and can, can scale up? You know, I, I think that from my perspective, um, one of the things that Mark said is really important. It is a, it's gonna take all options to come onto the table. And we do have to translate theory to practice. We have to be able to prove them out um, in, in actual practice on the grid. And uh, you know, that really needs to be our focus, is making sure that these new technologies that show the promise, um, that we move them out of the theory uh, through the lab and into commercial scale and into practice, then we'll know how they all work. Mark Jacobson, where does the new innovation need to happen? Where, where are the big breakthroughs that you see that need to happen to get to 100%? <clears throat> well, let me preface it. I think with existing technology, if you deploy it, you'll get new innovation along the way because deployment drops the cost, there's more money available to, for research, and so you can then, but we do not need a miracle new technology. So it's maybe fine tuning existing technologies, using them on larger scales, especially these storage technologies that are really used in a lot of example places, but we've never had a need for these large scale clean renewable energy storage before. So these are, so I think we, um, but I think that the biggest barriers, if you're asking that, are really practical things like zoning for long distance transmission. Uh, getting offshore wind, floating offshore wind turbines. I mean, once you have floating offshore wind turbines commercialized, then the game is over because there's just endless amounts of offshore wind on the West Coast, East Coast, US, and around the world. So I think it's really deployment that will generate more uh, improvements of technologies, plus some uh, better policies that will put in place to speed up certain things like 
floating turbines and, and long distance high voltage direct current transmission. We are gonna to go to audience questions and invite you to go to the microphone over there. And this is from Mark Jacobson. Um, are we on track in California to match your goal for 80% and then 100% time-wise and around the world, who's doing well and well, who isn't? Well, surprisingly, California, if you just look at the wind, water, and solar, which is our plan, is 25% in the electric power sector. So we're actually doing pretty well in the electric power sector. I mean, Governor Brown's goal is 50%. Our goal is 80% by 2030. Um, you know, it's pretty well, but I think, we, I think we can get beyond 50% by 2030. The other sectors, though, are lagging pretty far behind, so not so well. Um, worldwide, Norway is the furthest along in terms of installation of everything to get to 100% renewable energy. They have about 55% of everything they need. The United States, in comparison, has 3.7% of everything they need. China has like 3.1% or 3.2%. So there are some countries that are smaller that are doing much better. We've been listening at Climate One to Mark Farron, a member of the California Independent System Operator, Mark Jacobson, Professor of Engineering and Environmental Engineering at Stanford, and Steve Malnight, Senior Vice President of pg and &E. I'm Greg Dalton. Our thanks to the audience here in the room online. You can join the conversation on Twitter using our handle at Climate One and listen to podcasts and I Thank you all for coming and for listening. Thank you.